as you can see, I'm currently in Chicago. Why? Well, really just for my own enjoyment. But that's not the point, because welcome everyone and join me on my trip through American automotive history through its many museums and attractions. Like Detroit, the Motown or Motor City of the United States, and Los Angeles, which is arguably the center of car culture. Like I said, join me as I visit both these cities and many of its attractions. Welcome everyone to Ed's Auto Reviews USA Trip 2022. Enjoy! After visiting and getting a good impression of the Windy City, it was time to move to the next city, the Motor City. A four-hour drive, mostly through mundane landscape, much like back home, but with a nice little stop halfway through, at a nice little beach at Lake Michigan. I consider driving in the United States as a relaxed experience, as opposed to my country where it's customary to keep right as much as possible, in the USA you can pick any lane you like without immediately being tailgated by someone that wants to force you to move over to the right. Now, this does mean that you can get overtaken left and right, and freight trucks also seem to keep quite a steady pace, but overall it does lead to a more calm traffic image. And before you know it, you've reached Detroit. Detroit, the Motor City, the Troubled City, the city that rose and fell with the automobile. Although the city and some of its neighborhoods still face many challenges, there is a sense of optimism. Chatting with locals, they all say the same thing. It used to be a lot worse some 10 to 15 years ago. It's like the city has reached its ultimate low point and celebrates it can only go up from there. I'd like to believe that, as I was pleasantly surprised when I explored the city center. All buildings have been restored, the city streets are clean and tidy, with plenty of little green spaces, and there is even room for temporary events. I'd never thought I'd play mini golf on the corner of Woodward Avenue and Cadillac Square. The best example is Michigan's Central Train Station, what arguably used to be the crown jewel of the urban decay, but is now getting renovated and will open as a new social hub for innovation and technology. And this was our rental car. A 2009 Dodge Challenger RT, which I got through Turo. This retro-futuristic muscle car is powered by a 5.7-liter Hemi V8, making some 375 horsepower and a very cool sound. <laughs> Eighty-seven models to choose from. General Motors, makers of Chevrolet, Pontiac, Oldsmobile, Buick, and Cadillac, with the GM mark of excellence. The walk around town eventually brought me to the glass giant looming over the city center, General Motors Renaissance Center. In the lobby that is open to the public, I was pleasantly surprised that besides the new models, there were also some radical concept cars on display. And that was a case of meeting my heroes. Here are some of the highlights. The Cadillac Le Mans is an example of Cadillac's limited flirting with performance. As a luxury car maker, Cadillac wasn't exactly renowned for its sportiness, save for entering the 24 hours of Le Mans once in 1950. Drivers race for their cars as Europe's most grueling car race begins. It's 24 hours non-stop with two drivers to each car, 31 cars in a struggle for mastery. But ended up in 10th place. Sailing on its newly found racing pedigree, designer Harley Earl went on to create a low-slung, two-seat, fiber-bodied luxury roadster in 1953, named after the endurance race. I think you could see this as Cadillac's version of the Chevrolet Corvette. 
the XLR of the 1950s. The car remained a concept car with only four prototypes built and never entered production. The fate of some of these concept cars remained shrouded in mysteries, but this one was sent to the GM Heritage Center and was slightly altered. Down the road the styling was updated with quad headlights instead of two and a revised rear end with sleeker fins. The car is a beauty and shows many design tricks later adopted on regular Caddy models. We jump forward in time and take a look at this Buick Silver Arrow 3. To put it bluntly, it's nothing more than a slightly customized Buick Riviera, you know, the funky Bowtail edition. But the Silver Arrow is further modified by designer Bill Mitchell, with an even lower roofline, rectangular headlights instead of the usual round ones, high level warning lights placed in the roof that double as turning signals but look like the predecessor of the now mandatory third brake light, and was equipped with Max Track, a forerunner of modern day traction control. In all, it looks a lot sleeker, kind of what the original Boto Riviera should have been. The last one I have for you is the Cadillac Ciel, a concept car from the not so distant past. It's a hybrid car with a small electric engine and a twin turbocharged V6. But it doesn't really matter if you look at its design. It's an absolutely gorgeous cutting edge design and Cadillac contemplated whether to build the Ciel or not. I do not understand why they didn't do it. If you want to revitalize your brand, then do it with a bombshell such as this one. It's a massive boat, but one that leaves a deep impression on anyone. And that is exactly what Cadillac is all about, and should be. A massive, powerful, lavishly designed car. Oh well. Now, some more cars were on display. But what if you want to see more than just these cars in the main lobby? This might seem as an unassuming warehouse in some office park. But follow me. Because check this out. I present you the GM Heritage Center. That's right, the GM Heritage Center is not open to the public, but I was given the exclusive right to enter and film some of the most valuable and historically significant cars that General Motors ever made. Think of the first car of a certain model to ever roll off the assembly line and one-off concept cars. Let's start with a car that is arguably the most important of them all. The 1938 Buick Y-Job. What is it that makes this car so special? Well, it was renowned car designer Harley Earl's personal transportation and regarded as being the first ever concept car ever made. A car not intended for regular production, but to show off what would lie ahead in the future and what a car maker is capable of. Design-wise, I think the car is a full 10 years ahead of what was considered standard at the time. Headlights were no longer separated pods attached to the hood, but an integrated part of it. And on top of that, hidden, for a clean and sinister look, but are power operated. And so are the windows, two years before they were added to a regular production car. All in all, the styling is just right, slim, subdued, and never overdone like you would see in the coming decades on American cars. The bumpers are narrow and tightly hug the body. The waterfall grille is flat and doesn't stick out too much. And the rear is sleek, with very modest tail lines that are inserted in logical round shapes, with a touch of airplane in it. Many of the cars are grouped by GM's brands. You have an Oldsmobile corner, a Chevrolet corner, and a corner that celebrates the many highlights from Cadillac's past, including this beautiful red Cadillac V16. That's right, it's a 16 cylinder engine. In the race of who got the most cylinders, only a few cars ever in the entire history of the car received 
16 cylinders. Currently the only car available is Bugatti, but Cadillac already offered a 16 cylinder car all throughout the 1930s, right during the Great Depression, further stressing the exclusivity of this car during its day. Now, when we say America, we say V8. So the 452 cubic inch or 7.4 liter V16 is just two V8s back to back, right? In fact, no. The V8 design wasn't so common back when this car was developed. Instead, two inline 8 engines from Buick, known as the Fireball, were put together in a V layout to create one of the smoothest and most refined engines ever made, trapped in one of the most beautiful car bodies I have ever seen. Besides massive engines, General Motors also liked to present itself as a company that has always sought ways to power their cars with alternative energy sources, like electric cars. In the mid-60s, GM played around with the idea of making an electric car and deemed the new generation Corvair as the right car. Why? Well, first, it was the lightest car GM had at the time and Corvair had a rather un-American setup. The engine was in the rear. Swap out the rear petrol engine with an electric one and you have the frunk to put the batteries in. And voila, a concept vehicle named the Electrovair was created. When you first see it, Electrovair looks like any other car. Much like the countless other attempts to make an EV, this electric Corvair faces the same problems. The batteries were heavy and low-tech. The car wasn't really all that faster than a regular Corvair. Electrovair 2 can accelerate as quickly as a standard Corvair. But the range was, as expected, abysmal. The average range was about 60 miles, or 100 kilometers, and the batteries were worn out after charging them only a hundred times. The car was effectively useless. A better battery must be found to make a practical car but managed to generate some buzz within the automotive press. After that, the Electrovair was quickly forgotten, and it would take another half a century before GM would actually create its very first regular production EV. It is time to move on. The next day I had the pleasure to meet up with Adam, who you may know from fellow YouTube channel Rare Classic Cars and Automotive History, and if you don't, make sure to check him out. We went for a little neighborhood cruise in one of his many classic cars, this dark red Lincoln Continental Mark III, my all-time favorite personal luxury car. We also took time to do a little chatting about the YouTube Live and of course our shared passion and taste in cars. I will upload the interview as a separate video, but you can already watch it on his channel. And uh, I just want to say thank you, Adam, for having me over. It was really, really nice to meet you. Our last destination of our Detroit visit is arguably the biggest of them all, the Henry Ford Museum and the adjacent Greenfield Village. The Henry Ford is a museum that celebrates over two centuries of American industry and innovation. The museum displays all kinds of machinery, farming equipment and different forms of transportation, like planes, trains and, of course, automobiles. The cars shown in the museum are not all exclusively made by the Ford Motor Company. Instead, it shows a diverse collection of cars that are considered a milestone in the development of automobiles and the auto industry. All the cars on display have a story, whether it's about technology, like the Chrysler Turban car, politics, like the John F. Kennedy presidential Lincoln, yes, that Lincoln, or racial, like the GM Old Look City Bus, where black woman Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat to a white man and sparked an enormous civil rights reaction. And then there is so much more. Automobile safety wasn't really anyone's concern in the first half of the 20th century. You would be ridiculed if you got things like seat belts in the 1950s if you could get them at all. The car right in front of you was trying to change that. The 1957 Cornell Liberty Safety Car was an experiment done by Cornell Aeronautical Laboratory and the Liberty Mutual Insurance. It was a mutual search, five years starting in 1952, for creating the safest vehicle on the road and to design it in like a contemporary and attractive way. 
The car features numerous highly interesting safety measurements and designs that we take for granted today, but were revolutionary 70 years ago. For instance, the car has a panoramic windshield for 180 degree unobstructed view. It features soft interior materials and fabrics as opposed to the hard metals used around that time. The driver is sitting in the middle, so not to be too close to the sides of the car in case of an impact, and is also fully surrounded by wraparound padded console with a very early version of airbags. That was their way of keeping you in place. The driver operates airplane-like throttles instead of regular massive steering wheel that could impale you in case of an accident. The rear passengers have seat belts and also a very crude form of rear head restraints. These are little nets hanging from the ceiling so not to block the rearward visibility, like modern day head restraints do. The doors are deliberately styled in an unusual way. Big holes were made where the door handles are so that they are recessed and do not stick out. The doors also open in a manner like you would open or fold your curtains, although they do tend to stick out a bit, which could be dangerous when you've just parked your car at the side of the road and a car passes by at very close distance. So much for safety. The exterior of the car is protected by a large energy absorbing bumpers that wrap around all sides of the car, 20 years before they were officially mandated by the US government. Despite its contemporary looks and an effort to make safety a cool thing, the car was a cry in the wilderness. People were not yet ready and concerned about vehicle safety. It would take another 20 years or so before safety really became a public concern. And as expected, only one car was made. A deconstructed Ford Model T is an awesome way to show how complex the car actually is, despite being extremely simple compared to modern day cars. Although there goes a lot of manufacturing and assembling into make it Tin Lizzy, the car was designed to be a once in a lifetime purchase. Certain aspects of the car were designed in such a way to be logical and easy to understand for do it yourself repairs back in the home garage. Ford Model T. Buy once, enjoy it an eternity. This vehicle made me chuckle. The Oscar Mayer Wienermobile, and I can assure you that it looks a lot bigger in real life than on video, but my girlfriend begs to differ. Mm -hmm. Jokes aside, the Henry Ford describes the car as the ultimate result of the American love for hot dogs and cars come together on four wheels. This Wurstwagen was custom ordered by Oscar Mayer, maker of sausages and other meats. This vehicle is not new, as far back as the 1930s it was already a Wienermobile, built and designed for promotional purposes. It's like taking a hot dog cart to the next level. This sausage from 1952 rides on a Dodge chassis and was replaced by a newer version in 1958. But don't worry, with a bit of luck you can still catch one driving down the road even today. These were some of the many highlights of the museum, but let's get outside, to the Greenfield Village, right next to the museum. The Greenfield Village was established alongside the Henry Ford in the 1930s. It's an open-air, living history museum, the first in the country, dedicated to show how Americans lived since the founding of the nation, and what the USA looked like at the time Henry Ford grew up. This includes workshops, stores, factories, farm fields, and of course, a steam train. As the incredible luck would have it, the annual Old Car Festival was being held at the park. Usually the park is a bit more quaint, but now from far and wide people gather with their classic rides, almost strictly from pre-Second World War times. Never have I ever seen so many cars in absolute pristine condition from the 1930s, mostly from the more affordable makes, like the Ford Motor Company. And never have I ever seen them still driving around like they are daily drivers, perfectly maintained and driven by the proud owners, most of them just as old as the cars, if not older. Along with its vintage backdrop, it really adds to the overall atmosphere and I'm happy to witness it all. It was truly a beautiful experience and every so often you think it's 1932, instead of 2022. But it's time to get back into reality. My visit to the Henry Ford and the Greenfield Village conclude my stay in Detroit. 
I like the city. I sincerely hope it'll continue to improve in the coming years. And I'm glad I've met so many wonderful and friendly people and I got to see so many cars I could only dream of. But now it's time for me to move to the final destination. Los Angeles, the city of angels, the silver screen, beautiful nature, the wide, wide beaches and the ever, everlasting sun. Much like Detroit, it's a city that rose and fell with the automobile. Highways and avenues everywhere, parking everywhere, cars everywhere, traffic jams everywhere. Yet I believe I've found one of the rare places on earth where car culture is at its peak. Ultra luxury cars, high end sports cars, European cars, low riders, hot rods, vintage cars. This city has got it all. Time to check it out. And this was our rental car a 2020 Land Rover Range Rover Velar, a stylish SUV. Truth to be told is that it originally had booked a Corvette C7, but considering the general conditions of the roads in the USA that are sometimes not all that great, and fearing our bags might not fit, I decided to get something else, a bit more practical. An SUV with all the brown leather and luxuries I could ever wish for, as recommended by my girlfriend. She managed to talk me out of an American Corvette and into a British Velar. Oh well, what are you gonna do? God save the Queen, I suppose. Bless her soul. Mr. Pop. Good son, Tanya had the greatest and tried to copy it, but Tanya still has the only one that can promise a real Hawaiian tan, deeper, faster tan. Twice the tan and half the time. Tanya guarantees it or your money back. So join the fight against copycats. Go Hawaiian. Go T A N Y A. Tanya. Los Angeles weather. Night, morning, low clouds and fog. Hazy afternoon sunshine. Saturday and Sunday. Low tonight, 62 on a fractious Friday. High tomorrow, 74. Beaches now, 70. Valley, 80. Downtown, 75. Orange County. KHJ Los Angeles Our first stop is one of America's most premier auto museums, the Peterson Museum. The museum was established by Robert E. Peterson, creator and publisher of Hot Rod magazine as well as various other magazines. He eventually put his funds in preserving car culture and history by establishing the Peterson Automotive Museum. On the corner of Wilshire and Fairfax you'll find a remarkable building, that is the Peterson Museum. The building was restyled in 2015 and despite its loud exterior design, the interior is understated devoid of excessive theming so that the cars stick out and are the center of attention. The museum consists of several floors, each with their own theme. There is even room for temporary collections, like the many famous movie cars featured in James Bond movies, as well as a collection of Andy Warhol's pop art take on the automobile, according to him, mass market consumer goods. And who could forget the lowest level in the building, the vaults, where the museum keeps its worst best kept secrets. Let's have a look at some of the highlights. In the lobby I was greeted by two colorful cars and one of them you recognize instantly. The DeLorean or DMC-12 if you want to be more precise. The car became notorious because of its rumored stories around its launch and its creator and later on became even more famous because of that 80s movie. Back to the future. But let's focus on the car next to it. What is it? Well, it's the next step in the development of a company that makes you believe it never went away in the first place. This is the DMC Evolved, the new DeLorean for the 2020s. And it's back, for real this time. Whereas many EVs currently ride on retro 80s styling, the Evolved chooses not to fall for the retro trap and features a futuristic design, much like its ancestor back in the 80s. 
Only a few design elements refer to the original, like the wing doors and the overall shape. And of course, it's electric. It's what makes it futuristic. It's a very powerful GT with some 1300 horsepower and 1000 kilometers or 600 miles of range. Whether these numbers are true is yet to be seen, and we'll also see if this is going to do things differently or once again follow its father in its footsteps. Next up is this car, another sedan. Uh, no, seriously, this is called another sedan. It's an art piece created by Joey Ruiter and shows car design in its purest shape and form and is based on the full-size American cars of the mid-60s. As I always like to say it, a glass box on top of a metal box. I find this car very interesting. It lacks any form of fixtures, it doesn't have headlights, a grill, bumpers, mirrors or badging, and yet the basic body shell reminds me that of a 1968 Plymouth Fury. Does it mean that the Fury has one of the most generic car designs of the 1960s? What do you think this sedan looks like? It's an art piece and a car at the same time. You can drive it if you want. But in order to enter the car, you have to split it in half. How cool is that? But let's head down deep into the belly of the museum, the vaults. Arguably the sole reason I wanted to visit the museum in the first place. Now, I'm not going to spoil too much, you'll see that in a future video, but let me show you what I think is the ultimate highlight of the vault. The Rolls-Royce round door. I almost started to tear up when I saw this car. I think this is probably the most beautiful car ever created. Even non-car people should agree that this is not a car, this is art. Or pornography. The year of construction of this Rolls is 1925, but the body features a decidedly aerodynamic 1930s design. How does that work? Ah, welcome to the magic of coach building. In the early days, the rich would buy a chassis and drivetrain from a renowned car maker, like Rolls Royce, and then order a custom body to be bolted on top of that, just to further distinguish yourself from the plebs. This car was originally a Rolls-Royce Phantom 1 from 1925, but received custom bodywork done by Belgian coach builder Jonkheren in 1934, and the end result is just one badass looking car. The front end features a big, bad, bold and slanted shield-shaped grille, with two bullet-shaped headlights surrounded by massive flowing front fenders. The side features the Rolls main party trick, perfectly round passenger doors, looking like portholes, another styling trademark of the Art Deco movement. And the rear slope downward in a graceful manner, following the flowing lines of the rear fenders, only to be interrupted by a massive center fin. The round door rolls. It's the Batmobile before the Batmobile. You can say and hate a lot about California, but if there is one thing that is truly magical, it's the daily sunset. An hour before the sun is gone, the city gets a golden gloss. The sky turns red, purple, blue, yellow and orange at the same time. The night has begun. Tonight is movie night. Up in the hills there is a park and a pop-up movie screen, live music and some food trucks makes the venue complete. The movie? Grease. A 70s musical featuring John Travolta and Olivia Newton-John. It's a movie about life as a teenager in the 1950s, about a bunch of greasers and high school girls, about summer love. A movie that depicts the happy-go-lucky 1950s just a bit more colorful than it might have been. But what if you want to experience that period in time again? Los Angeles is renowned for its diverse car culture. Car shows are being held all over the city every weekend, including the Friday evening car meet at Bob's Big Boy. Bob's is a quintessential American diner which had the honor to serve some famous Hollywood people in the past, and with a bit of luck you'll catch a Jay Leno or two at the car meet. Naturally, I was curious to see what a car meet in America would look like. 
To be fair, it doesn't differ a whole lot from the car meets I see back home. It's a mix of classic American and European cars, with some usual suspects, like Tri-5 Chevys, Chevelles and Mustangs. Overall, the cars are still pretty diverse, ranging from 1930s Packards to a 20-year-old Mercury Marauder and everything in between, like modern-day sports cars, wannabe Bugattis and sporty Beetles. It was a nice meeting altogether. But it's time to hurry back to the beach for catching my daily dose of Californian sunset. This concludes my trip to the United States. I got what I came for. I've seen some cars I could only dream of of ever seeing and met the most wonderful and friendly people and got to see impressive cities and landscapes in the process. I hope you enjoyed this little documentary about my visit. And don't worry, these were only some of the highlights. In the coming weeks, I'll upload several videos that go a lot deeper into the many museums I visit. So, once again, thank you for watching. And who knows, maybe this won't be my last visit. Until next time, America.